10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me. This is Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier. I am here with you in 2019, January 4th, and hello, everybody. I am so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to be here in the new year, enjoying my time with you all, and I thank you. I thank you all for being here with me, and I know you may hear some background noise on and off. It is a cold day in New York State. What can we do? But uh, I, I wanted to first start off, I hope everyone had a great Christmas. I hope they had a great New Year and that the year has started well for everyone. Obviously, one of the things that you may see is a little bit different. Uh, I shaved. Uh, just going for, well, I, I got tired of seeing all the gray hair. So that's why we see that a little bit different. That being said, it's still the same old me, still the 15 year, 50 year old man going over all the interesting things. And I think you'll find it interesting today. Let's start off with what's been going on here in 2019. Uh, 2018 was a year of bookends. We started the year with a government shutdown. We ended the year with a government shutdown. The shutdown was about immigration in 2018 in January and at December of 2018. And here we are in 2019, and it continues to be the issue. The government continues to be shut down, and I know a lot of people are a little bit worried about that. They're just expecting all kinds of crazy things to happen there. It's going to be shocking and devastating for everyone. Doom and gloom is coming to the world, and quite honestly, it really hasn't. If most people will notice, the majority of people have not had a change in their lives. Because the government is bloated. It's just too large. And it's very obvious that because we've gone weeks now, we're in the third week of our uh, government shutdown, and yet no one's lives have been changed. We didn't see Christmas end for anyone. We didn't see the New Year stop for everyone. Um, it, is there going to be some further complications? Sure. But about 75% of the government continues to move forward as normal. And it looks like this may be something that's going to be quite extended. According to President Trump, in his rebuke of Nancy Pelosi, the Democrats are looking to try and fund the government without spending $5 billion on a wall for the southern border, which is a little bit funny because when you work it out, it's about 0.01% of the entire budget. The government spends about $4 trillion on each year, uh, actually a little bit over $4 trillion. And this is a rounding error. In other words, if you were to make the entire national budget, to put it into real world terms, if we're talking about $4,000, this would be about five bucks. That's what they're arguing over, $5. It's a rounding error. It's, it's not even a number. So that's roughly what we're talking about here. And because the Democrats don't want to give the money for uh, the border wall to secure our borders, and to protect our nation because they want open borders and open immigration and the path to citizenship because they're refusing to give $5 billion. That's why the government is shut down. President Trump won't budge because it's a rounding error in the numbers and Democrats won't budge because it's political for them. They want to have path to citizenship. And that's what the whole thing's about. It's, it's really ridiculous. Besides the fact that we haven't had a budget in about 20 years, that's even worse. But yet the Democrats have put in a bill. Um, the first day, legislative day was today, and we saw that 239 bills were put through. And we see that Nancy Pelosi is trying to get the government funded uh, without the border wall. And President Trump has said that won't happen. We will see. Now, amongst all of this, there has been a lot of conversation about women in government. It's one of the biggest issues being talked about right now is, oh my goodness, do you see all the women in government? And everyone's going crazy about that. They're going crazy about, well, there's women in government. You know, There's so many women in government and we have to talk about the women who are in there. Well, let's talk about the women because first of all, 
If someone has to make an argument to you that says, this is great because of this person's inherent ability. A woman, you're born a male, a born a woman, you're born black, white, Hispanic, you're born. That doesn't inherently make you better or worse. Nancy Pelosi is not better or worse as a speaker or as a Democrat because she is a woman. That is irrelevant. Whether she's white or a woman or a Christian or a Jew or uh, a Muslim, it really makes no difference. Those aren't factors that have anything to do with, is she intelligent? Which, based on some of the comments she's made, you can argue that. Um, does she have a plan? Does she understand the issues that are going on? Uh, you know, is she capable? Is she efficient? Those are things, those are talents. Those are skills. They have nothing to do with whether or not you're born this gender or that gender, this color or that color. It really makes sense, or what you prefer, whether it's a political preference or a religious pre preference. It makes no difference whatsoever. So why are people talking about the fact that so many women are in government now? Because it's about gender politics. Because they're distracting you from any of the issues that you should be talking about. I mean, if we want to talk about how great it is, I know a lot of people have been talking about, you know, they want to talk about the women in government. Here's something. I bet you haven't heard her name. Kim, uh, Young Kim is her name. Young Kim is the first, first American uh, Korean woman to be elected to Congress, representing the 65th Assembly District in Congress. I bet you haven't heard her name. And do you know why? Because Young Kim is a Republican. Okay, she's not a Democrat. She's a woman. She's uh, a minority. And you would think in this political atmosphere where it's about gender and uh, your gender and your race are more important than anything else, then we should be hearing about this woman who, you know, who's a Korean American and we should be celebrating her. We should be hearing her name. She should be all over the news. And instead, no one talks about her. And you don't even, most people don't even know she got elected because she's a Republican. And therefore, the, her ethnicity, her race don't matter. Her gender don't matter. It only matters if you're a Democrat. Well, then it's important. But anyone else, well, it doesn't matter. They're, they're ignored and shunned. Mia Love Mia was shunned. Uh, Tim Scott shunned. Why? Because they're the wrong kind of minority or the wrong kind of gender because they have a preference politically, which is ridiculous. And that, that tells you that inherently it is not better or worse to be a male, female, black, white, doesn't matter. It's not inherently better or worse because if it was, then they'd be talking about young Kim. But instead, who are we talking about? We're talking about Rashida Talib. Rashida Talib must be making her constituents so impressed. They must be so happy to know that this woman is going out there on the first day that she got, she's been sworn in, she goes into Congress, and now she's talking about impeachment, which we were promised across the nation. We were told impeachment was not what Democrats were looking to do. That was not what we were, they were being elected for. They wanted to run the country. And the very first things that we're hearing from Nancy Pelosi, impeachment. What are we hearing from Ms. Uh, Ms. Tlaib? Impeachment. Isn't that great? And she's saying it in the crudest way possible. No decorum, no respect. I mean, where's the civility? Again, civility doesn't matter. Why? She's a Democrat talking about a Republican. So therefore, civility doesn't matter. She can say anything she wants. Come on. I mean, there's something to be said. She's supposed to be a figurehead to look up to. And this is the way you would speak. I mean, imagine going to a business meeting and having someone just curse, curse at you or curse about someone while you're there in the business meeting. That's unprofessional. It's undisciplined. It's undignified. Point blank. And, and when you're in Congress, you're supposed to be held to a higher standard. You're supposed to be above that. That doesn't mean you have to love everybody else that's in Congress with you. You don't have to love the president. You still get to have an opinion. 
you're still an American citizen, but there is something about respect. And if you want to say the president doesn't give enough respect, fine, you can make that argument. But that doesn't mean just because someone else isn't doing something, you shouldn't do it either. Two wrongs don't make a right. And if you want to say, well, the president has no decorum, well, then show the decorum, the respect of the office that is due the office and say, this is the example you should be. Rashida Tlaib should be an example of what to do when you are dealing with someone you don't agree with politically. Instead, we have this derogatory speech. I mean, was she talking like that on the campaign trail? Did her constituents know that that's how she conducts herself, how she's representing them? I mean, that's something I would expect to hear from someone down the block, you know, in the Bronx where I grew up or even in some of the sections of the southern tier where I live, uh, the less educated individuals are probably more prone to say something like that. And I don't think that represents her district. That doesn't represent uh, women or is a good role model for young women or young men. Uh, that's not how politics is supposed to go. So it's kind of upsetting. But I mean, if we're going to say that women, and, and here's the thing, uh, Young Kim does not say that. She doesn't conduct herself in that manner. She doesn't go out there and she doesn't curse the Democrats because she disagrees with them. She isn't out there being derogatory and, and lowering the stature of the office of a member of Congress. You don't hear that from her. That's not how she conducts herself. But Rashid uh, Tlaib, she's more than happy to do that. Kind of sad. I mean, and there's the comparison. We're getting so much attention focused on someone who can't respect her constituents, uh, people who are looking and learning about her. She can't respect them enough to be able to convey her ideas without guttural, vulgar language. But yet, when we have another woman, another minority, who doesn't act in that manner, who represents their constituents with high honor, we don't talk about that. That's not important. No, no, we, we don't have to talk about that person. Even Nancy Pelosi, who is the Speaker of the House, shocking. I mean, there wasn't anyone, there was never anyone else being considered. So that's a whole other thing. But Nancy Pelosi, when given the opportunity to try and guide and be a mentor to this brand new congresswoman, what does she say? Well, you know, she shouldn't have said it like that. But the president's bad, too. Well, that's not an excuse. Come on, Nancy. Speaker Pelosi, you should know better than this. Just because someone has bad behavior does not excuse anyone else's bad behavior. Just because you don't like someone doesn't mean you can do anything you want. And Ms. Pelosi would hate that. Imagine if someone said that about President Obama. Just think about it. If someone had said that about President Obama, Nancy Pelosi would have lost her mind in Congress on the floor saying, how dare they speak about the office of the presidency like this? How dare they be such a bad role model? Why can't we hold Rashida Tlaib to the same standard? because she's a woman? Well, isn't that discrimination? If I would hold a man to that standard, shouldn't I also hold her to that standard? Otherwise, aren't we being sexist? If she's, it's, it's about her race or color, anyone else, if anyone else said that about President Obama, we would hold them to a standard saying, you cannot do that. How dare you do that? That's just disrespectful and wrong. Why would we make a new set of standards just because it's a woman, a Muslim, and a Democrat. Those aren't reasons. That's insulting. And to say that we should have a different standard or that we should accept it because of those reasons is insulting and it's not beneficial. It's, it's the least beneficial thing we could possibly do because if we have different rules for different people, then we have chaos. We don't have a good system.
But with that said, uh, we're going to be taking a quick break in a second here. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, please uh, come out, check out the Voss Political Commentary website where you get to see everything that I've written. We've got about 2,200 articles there. We have about, uh, oops, sorry, wrong thing. Uh, we have about 2,200 articles there. We have about 400 videos there going over all of the things that we've been doing for the last 12 years and continuing to go forward with. And we're looking forward to seeing you. And your help keeps the lights on, keeps us active and busy. And we look forward to that. But with that said, uh, we're going to jump over and we're going to take a quick break. First break for 2019. And then we'll come back. We're trying to keep this on track and on time. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in our government uh, now that we have this new change going on. So we'll be back in just one moment.
Thank you for coming back and joining me here at the No Sound Bites Allowed. Uh, this is your host, Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier, and I appreciate each and every one of you. I thank you all for being here with me and joining me as we have this discussion about the issues that matter, about the things that are affecting all of our lives, and I enjoy and appreciate every single one of you. Thank you very much. Now. And the first segment, we're talking a little bit about uh, the fact that if we want to be truly fair, if we want to be non-partial, non-partisan, if we want to judge people properly, then we should be looking at Young Kim in the same way that we're looking at Nancy Pelosi, in the same way that we look at Camila Harris, the senator, uh, the same way that we're looking at Representative Rashida Tlaib, um, Re Representative Young excuse me, Representative Kim, is exactly the same. They're women, they're members of minority groups, and they're elected officials. And they should all be able to handle themselves with a bit of decorum. And that's what we were talking about there, that we shouldn't judge people by different standards based on inherent attributes given to them by birth. And speaking about the way some people are being judged or how they judge others... I to find out, we've invited been, Kevin uh, Parker on the show tonight. He's the New York State Carlson, Senator from Brooklyn. You just saw on that tape. Uh, Senator Parker, welcome. Thanks for coming on tonight. Thanks for having me on, Tucker. Uh, Parker uh, for the state of New York. But I will get to that in just a moment. Instead, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the top bills in Congress um, that just came out. There were just 239 bills were put through today, January 4th. And you can see that at congress.gov. That's right. You can go to congress.gov and you'll be able to see that. There's actually more than 239 bills if you also include what's called the House Joint Resolutions and the House Resolutions. When you put it all together, there's about 250, uh, maybe even a little bit more than that. And God, that is a lot of information there. There are a lot of these bills. And so... Um, there's just a lot of information to go through. So let's talk about what are we what are we seeing there? I mean, what kind of things are there? That was actually not the sound effect I wanted to have. What I wanted was this Newsflash. That's right. I wanted the newsflash. And the newsflash is that we have seen over 250 bills put in um, that are going to affect our lives. This is the agenda that Nancy Pelosi wants to set for the nation. These are the things that she thinks is important. Is it the jobs report came out today? 300,000 jobs were created. President Trump has been doing a very good job. The Republican Congress did a great job lowering taxes, 
individually and for corporations, which has led to jobs uh, at a rate at a rate and a pace that we were told under President Obama could never be seen again, that our country would never have that kind of economy, that we would never see that kind of growth. And yet here it is and it has continued. But that is something that will slow down. The Fed is increasing interest rates and they will on historically go to about four and a half percent. So keep that in mind if you have any loans out there that have variable rates. If you're looking at your credit cards, the interest rates will be going up for the next two years. You're going to be paying more money on this. If, so keep that in mind. Now, the way to offset that normally is to have more jobs. You create more jobs, more small businesses, and people are able to go and create their own businesses or get raises uh, to have more opportunities in selecting better paying jobs. And that usually helps out with that. That's not what we're seeing with the Democrats right now. As we mentioned, the first thing is they're trying to get out of the government shutdown because they're trying to save $5 billion, a rounding error, roughly in real world terms, $5 out of 4000 that's being spent. Why? Who knows? But that's not the only thing they're looking at. There's about 15 bills out of the 250 that really caught my attention. And I went to the congress.gov site and I was looking through it. Uh, I do recommend everyone else do that. And uh, I didn't hear from Anthony Brindisi. He's the new congressman for the New York 22nd District. He's a Democrat. He won. Congratulations for him. Um, and in his conversation, he didn't mention anything. Uh, he was on the news today. He's been talking about how he didn't vote. Well, he didn't vote for Nancy Pelosi for speaker. Again, who cares? It was a done deal. She was already going to get elected. There was no other option. There was no one else to take the job. There was no competition. So whether he voted for her or not is completely py uh, pyrrhic. It, it's irrelevant. It didn't matter if he voted for her because there was no one else that was going to get the job. It's just, it's a way of just playing games and saying, well, look, see, I'm very independent because I didn't vote for her in a vote that didn't matter, that never counted. But you did take $4 million from her to run for your election. And she was running campaigns for nine months in a row. The very first commercials coming out were from Nancy Pelosi. You owe her a couple of favors there. That's just a political reality. You owe her favors, her and Governor Cuomo, for all the money that they raised for you and the money that they directly paid for you and all the commercials you put out there. So, Mr. Brindisi, when you say, uh, I voted in a vote that really makes no difference and say, hey, I'm, I'm independent, I'm sorry, no, no, you still got $4 billion on a tab that you owe and that's going to come up. And some of the things that's going to come up on are some of the bills that are out there. And there's a bunch of them. Uh, let me go over it. Again, it's the congress.gov. You can go look this up yourself. But a couple of the things that I found to be really curious, um, and in no particular order, but there's the House Joint Resolution number 7 and also uh, number 9, where uh, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee uh, Sheila, Sheila Lee Jackson, Sheila Jackson Lee, has asked that the United States government formally apologize, a national apology for slavery, which I thought we were well beyond, and I thought that was well resolved with the Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendments, Civil Rights Movement, um, the president being President Obama. Uh, this is you know, something that has never left the national attention and mindset for 200, 300 years, uh, this is not new news. So kind of thought that was handled already, but no, she wants, uh, she wants to make sure that there is a national apology that is given. In addition, there is the House Resolution Number 13, which is to impeach President Trump, as I mentioned, uh, which I thought was really crazy. I, actually, I got them out of order. Oops, I got it out of order. There's so many of these. Uh, actually, House Joint Resolution 7 is to eliminate the Electoral College. 
Democrats want to disenfranchise voters. House Resolution, House Joint Resolution, H.J. Res. 7, is about uh, eliminating the Electoral College. And I apologize, I got that wrong. Um, and that's because, well, they just don't care about voters in the Midwest. They don't care about voters not on a coast. Um, they're looking for five cities. They want all the voters in five cities to count, and everyone else doesn't count. So if you're in Rhode Island, you don't count. If you're in Wisconsin, you don't count. If you're in Kansas, you don't count. If you're outside of Chicago, you don't count. If you're outside of L.A., you don't count. That's what they're looking for with that, which I think is insane. And their reasoning is, well, we don't like the Electoral College because it hasn't always worked for us, the Democrats. And since it hasn't always worked for them, um, because they are appealing to five cities rather than 50 states, well, then let's change the rules. That's their answer, which I think is insulting to 300, and 300 million people as opposed to the 30 million people that are in those cities. Well, actually, it's a little higher. Um, so they call that a way to protect people's voting rights, which is ridiculous. There's a reason why we have Electoral College, because if you don't happen to live in five cities, the five major cities in the nation, you, will, you still count. If you get rid of the Electoral College, then you don't count. And that's just how it goes. So that's and that's even why New York State is considering an Electoral College, because in New York State, Governor Cuomo won basically three cities, the three largest cities in roughly the three largest cities, which are the three largest counties in New York State. And that's why he won. The overwhelming majority of counties and people in or the areas representing the people of New York State did not vote for him. But he won because of the counties, those three cities, and that's it. And that's what they want for the entire nation. It's kind of insulting. But going on beyond that, um, we're looking at, there's several bills that are saying, like uh, House Resolution 230, uh, 230, excuse me, 236, which says that um, members of Congress should not be paid unless they pass a budget, which I guarantee you will go nowhere. We've seen, we've seen this bill before. Uh, it's going to go absolutely nowhere. Uh, we see that there's HR House Resolution 212, which is Hello Cylindra. It's the government picking and choosing businesses. This is to be able to give money to green energy companies um, so that they can start up. It's basically how we gave money to Solyndra. It's exactly that same idea. Over 50% of those companies, uh, when the last green energy initiative went through, half of them all failed. And the only people who lost money were the taxpayers. Millions, tens of millions of dollars lost on over 25, uh, I believe it was, I believe it was 20 companies in total. They all failed and the taxpayers lost money on it. And we don't have green energy. And the green energy companies don't work. But they want to do it again. Um, H.R. 198 is the term limits. It's a bill to limit the number, you know, instead of having people there for decades in a job that was never intended for people to be there more than one, two years, uh, uh, one or two terms, they've been there for 20, 30, I mean, Nancy Pelosi, 30 years. These are not jobs that are meant to be lifelong. They aren't meant to be nobles. This is a, this is meant to be a temporary job. And so there are bills like H.R. 198 saying, well, let's make it term limits so that just like the president, you got to get out and let someone else in and cut the corruption, which we see constantly, always from the oldest members of Congress, tend to be the ones uh, the longer you're there, the more likely you're into corruption, and we've seen that happen consistently. Uh, there is uh, the H.R. 169. This is a bill that is specifically targeting police and looking to usurp the local police force by putting federal oversight on police. Police, uh, if 
HR 169 goes through, then this will tell police how to follow a federal guideline on how to conduct traffic stops. Now, whether or not you think that police should have more training and sensitivity training, that's one question. You can have that argument. You can have that discussion. The question is, should the federal government be in control of what's happening in your local police department? That's troubling. That's the government taking over and taking more power and more control at a local level. The government gets to decide this, not your local police force that deals with your local community. That is a problem. That is a, go that is a governmental overreach, and we should all be scared of that. Another one. Uh, the ant Where is it? I have it here. Um, there is a bill, H.R. 153, will never see the light of day. You'll never hear it from anyone else uh, to look, but I would suggest you look it up. This is a bill that would not stop all funding to sanctuary cities, cities that have decided to violate federal law. They are picking and choosing the laws that they wish to follow, and they are demanding and expecting the federal government to pay them to break the law. This is rewarding criminals. And so H.R. 153 says, we won't do that. If you break the law, consciously, willfully break the law, then you should be held accountable, just like any citizen would be held accountable, just like every politician is expected to be held accountable, just like everyone. These are the laws. If you don't follow the law, why would anyone else? If your city can't follow the law, then why would the citizens of that city follow the law? I mean, it's just straightforward. So that's another uh, very interesting uh, piece of legislation. It will never see the light of day. I don't expect that Nancy Pelosi will ever let it come up for a vote, but it's been submitted, so it's out there. Uh, looking at, they want uh, Democrats under Nancy Pelosi are looking to change the way that votes are counted. Get ready for voting corruption. H.R. 138 and H.R. 93 will change the way we vote forever. And this will allow for more corruption and more dead people to vote than we have ever seen before. Um, this H.R. 138 allows you to vote by mail. Everyone in the nation can vote by mail and or vote in person. So imagine how many times we're going to see mail letters. And we've seen this already in many counties, especially in Chicago, uh, where individuals, 53 people live in or have the same address. None of them live there. It's an abandoned house, but 53 people live in the same house and they all registered to vote from there. Dead people get to register to vote and they're all going to be sending in by mail ballots because that's easier than actually just walking in and voting. And if you don't, if you think there's a bunch of corruption now in the voting and there is, then you're going to see a whole lot more. And, um, and then to make it even more complicated, they would also have same day registration. So you can mail in the ballot, go down to uh, the local precinct or a different precinct, register to vote on that same day and vote again. And hope and you can only hope that the government will be able to catch that, which they usually don't unless they have an idea or reason why they should. So that's a problem. Um they there's a HR 51 where Democrats want to make Washington, D.C. a state, obviously ignoring all history. There is a reason why Washington, D.C. is not in any state. And that's because if it were in a state, that state would be having preference. It, there is a political uh, a, a conflict of interest if it is a state of its own. Because then it has power that it's being the center of power, it would be able to use that influence against the rest of the nation. But considering that it is a high democratic uh, population, I can see why they want to have a 51st state to try and break through, like in the Senate, and to have more influence throughout the nation. Even as people go to states like Texas, which are Republican strongholds, out of places like New York. People are leaving from New York to go to Texas uh, in droves.
but that's another one. And in terms of the National Apology for Slavery, slavery that's H.R. 40. I got that wrong. H.R. 35 is about making lynching a hate crime. Now, here's something that gets me about this. Okay, And these are all bills that you're not going to hear from anyone else. No one else is going to talk about them. No one's going to mention them. But you should know this is what's going to affect your life. And I know it's a little bit boring and dry, but you should know about these things. Uh, let's think about this. One, how rampant is lynching right now? Because as far as I'm aware, it really isn't. And we already have laws to address lynching. It's called attempted murder and murder. I don't need anything else. We all know if you're lynching someone, you're attempting to kill them. That's, a, that's attempted murder. We've got a law for that. If you actually succeed in lynching someone, that's called murder. We have a law for that. How in making it a hate crime is going to be any worse than murder or attempted murder? Why do we care? If, if you have caught someone who has been doing lynching, what do you need hate crime for? That doesn't, they're going to have a life sentence or they're going to go to the death penalty. What's a hate crime going to do? Really, what, what's the difference? I don't understand that. I, I really can't understand why we need a new category. We need a new law, a hate crime. For what? It's already a crime. We don't need a hate crime. It is a crime. Stop trying to break it down and, and trying to find loopholes. It, it just finds more loopholes for people to try and get out of these things. Try them for the crime that they did. If you're trying to lynch someone, which no one really is these days, but if someone were to try and lynch them, try them for attempted murder or murder. You don't need a hate crime. You really don't. And if you can't prove that they did it, then they should go. Don't try and come up with a new category just to try and get them anyway. It's just, it's wrong. Oh, and here's another big one. Uh, uh, and I'm going to cut it right there, but please go to the site and check this out yourself. But there's one that really caught my attention as well, which is House, uh, joint, House joint Resolution. Oops, I didn't write down the number. Uh, I think it's like 20, uh, which is make health care a constitutional right. They want to make health care a constitutional right. This is insane. This is stupid. Health care is not a constitutional right. You don't have a right to health care because you, you just don't. You have a right to life pursuit of happiness the happiness clause, but you don't have a right to health care. I don't have a right to give you health care, to pay for your health care. That's not a right. That's just, they're just making up these things because they want to then enforce and force people to do what the government wants, as in Obamacare, where they force that on people, saying, well, you have a right for this, so you must pay for it. Why? No, that's not, again, our Constitution is a limiting document. The government only has the power that we allow it to have. And the more laws we make, the fewer rights we have. By making this a constitutional right, you're actually taking away someone's rights and freedoms and giving it to the government and taking away a person's choice. And I'm very much against that. Okay, so I just ran through a bunch of these bills that you will never hear. Um, several of them will never pass. You're never going to hear about them in the main news. If they do pass, and some of them may, like um, the police, federal control over local police, you may see health care become a constitutional right. You may see lynching become a hate crime. You may see D uh, D.C. become a state or elimination of the Electoral College. These are things that are going to change your life and your children's lives and your grandchildren's lives forever. And it's not going to be a positive thing. And you don't have to believe me. These are summaries. The full text of these bills have not come out yet, but check it out. Go to congress.gov and see for yourself. See what's going on because this will change your life. Whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's going to change it so you should know. And I have the link up there. But with that said, I'm going to take a quick break because we went over on time. And then we'll go into a short bit just before the end. Okay? 
enjoy that band. I should take a second just to make a uh, quick comment here. Um, whenever you see any of the music groups here, if you see me uh, taking a drink of something, if you see me smoking a cigarette, I, n nothing is endorsed here. No one has paid me for anything. Uh, that's because I enjoy the bands and I enjoy the music. Hopefully you do too. We'll be adding a little bit different music selection for 2019 and I hope everyone's going to enjoy that if you have suggestions or if you're a band and you have a video please let me know uh, I'll be more than happy to consider that for the audience here and see if people enjoy that um, so I just want you to know it's not like someone paid me for this it's just because I wanted to do it but of course I appreciate each and every one of you I thank you all for the time that you spend here with me going through this information that I know sometimes may seem a little bit dry, uh, but it's important. These are things that we should talk about, and we should be able to have a very simple conversation. Unlike uh, Representative Talib, we shouldn't curse at each other for this. We shouldn't have to hate each other because we have different ideas, but we should be able to talk about these issues and say, hey, this is going to affect me forever. Whether I vote for it or not, you should at least know about it because it's going to affect our lives. So let's have that conversation. Why not? Uh, and I believe it's important. And I believe in hearing your voice 
and sharing thoughts with you. I look forward to your comments. As you can see, you can get in touch with us either at the website uh, for the Voss Political, uh, which is the mvoss.com. You can go to our podcast at the vosspolitical.podbean.com. Leave a comment there. You can call and leave a message, or you can reach me on Twitter at, at mvconsult. Um, any of these ways, please get in touch with us. And, of course, on Facebook every Saturday from 12 to about 1.30, we do a Facebook Live event where we talk with everyone, and you get to say whatever you want right then and there on Facebook Live with us asking your questions and talking about the issues you think are important. As I mentioned, I'll also be following up very shortly with uh, what's going on in the New York State Senate, especially with the password bill and the red flag legislation. I have not forgotten about that. And that's coming up very shortly, especially as Emperor Cuomo has continued his push to be make New York State the most progressive capital the world has ever seen on his way to the uh, run for the presidency in 2020. God help us all. But that being said, because every, think about it, every progressive capital you can think of is failed. Venezuela, the Soviet Union, North Korea, China, um, California, San Francisco, all failed cities, all failed states, all failed governments, it doesn't work. It, it, the progressive, which is the, or now the democratic socialist or socialism, it fails every single time it's been done, no matter where you go. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, God help us with Cuomo. How he got, it's amazing he got reelected. But that being said, it is the 4th of January. Um, it's late at night, but it's the 4th of January still. And amazingly, politics does not end. It does not end. Just because we came back, it's the first couple of days of the new year, people are already looking into the next cycle, which is the, for on the federal level, it's the 2020 congressional cycle. Anthony Brindisi just got sworn in, uh, just voted for Nancy Pelosi, and it appears that he already has a challenger for 2020. That's right, Steve Cornwell for people in New York State. So the election cycle for 2020, I believe, may have officially started already. If, with the New York 22nd District, one of the top 10 districts in the nation, and the Broome County District Attorney, uh, Mr. Steve Cornwell, has come out and said, uh, as of today, January 4th, that he is not going to be seeking re-election. Now, you may be saying to yourself, what's that matter? Well, um, his reasoning is he doesn't want a conflict of interest, that he doesn't want to try and have uh, to get reelected, and then, in the middle of that, re uh, that new term, leave, leave office, which means that he expects to be in a different office. That is the classic preparation for another run. It means he's looking for another elected office. Which elected office? I don't know. See, I wish at least Governor Cuomo was honest. If he wanted to run for 2020, he should have given up the governorship and run for 2020 instead of splitting his term, which is what his intention is, I believe, and everyone in New York State and everyone in Democratic politics believes that that's what he's looking to do. And, and Camila Harris... Uh, Cory Booker, uh, <laughs> even Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is incapable of running for president, not just because she's an idiot, but because by constitution, she's too young. She cannot run. God help us all if she were to win. Um, and no, I don't like her. I don't like her politics. I, not because she's a woman, not because she's Hispanic. I'm Hispanic. Who cares? Um, it's because she just doesn't know what she's talking about. And we deserve better than that as a nation. But um, Mr. Cornwell is saying that essentially he's looking for another elected office. He doesn't want to split a term 
because that would not be fair to the public who elected him for a full term, which I respect and I can understand. Therefore, we have to say, well, what offices are there? Now, some people have said, well, maybe he expects to become a judge or, or get a federal appointment. While that's possible, um, I don't know that he's, and this is no disrespect to Steve Cornwell, district attorney. I've met him. I've spoken with him a couple of times. He's in Broome County, and so I've, I've dealt with him. And he's a Republican, a fellow Republican like myself, so I do not wish to say anything negatively. But uh, he hasn't handled any big cases that would raise him to the federal level. That's just a fact. There hasn't been any massive drug bust, uh, some massive criminal action that he put forth that helped the public enough to raise his attention on a federal level. That would give him a judgeship. He hasn't done anything that would equate to that judge, that, that judicial honor. Now, I could be wrong. He may well have done something that I've missed, or maybe he's far more influential in the legal sphere than I am aware of. I'm not a lawyer, so I could be completely wrong here. But given that, that low profile, uh, that lack of exposure, I mean, Preet Bharara, if, we are, if people remember him, who was doing a lot of the, uh, he did a lot of convictions. He got rid of Sheldon Silver as the emperor of New York under the Speaker, uh, Speaker of the State Assembly uh, and Dean Skelos uh, as well, a Republican. Uh, he got rid of these individuals so that no one could touch. And yet Preet Bharara got him out and he didn't become a judge. And he didn't get a federal appointment, even though he had national attention, widespread attention on his, uh, his efforts to fight corruption. And he didn't get it. So I don't see that being the goal that uh, uh, Mr. Cornwell, District Attorney Cornwell, will be going for. What does make sense, uh, we have a weak Congressman in the name of uh, Representative Brindisi. I know Anthony for five years now, six years now. So, uh, and I've said this to his face, and I'll say it here. Um, I, I don't believe he's a strong candidate. Uh, I don't think he's a strong representative. I believe he's just uh, a yes man for the Republican Party, uh, excuse me, for the Democratic Party. And it, I would love for him to prove me wrong. I would. And I'm waiting for him to have an interview with me so we can have that discussion. Maybe I've missed something in the last six years that I've spoken with him. And I'm more than happy to see that. Maybe he's going to uh, take the money and run. Take Nancy Pelosi's $4 million and run uh, on his own path. Maybe. Uh, I don't believe it, but, you know, it's possible. But he's a junior member of Congress. He's an unproven individual in terms of the state assembly, in terms of his viewpoints. If we all remember, he we don't know where he stands on the Second Amendment. He's refused to mention or answer anyone's questions about that, uh, whether they be Democrats or Republicans. He hasn't answered anyone's question about that. In fact, several times on record, he has flip-flopped his position on the Second Amendment uh, in, in terms of taxes. He refused to answer whether or not he would support the tax increase that Nancy Pelosi has promised that she would do throughout all of 2018. Uh, he wouldn't answer that. So there's a lot of issues we have no idea where he stands on. Um, when you have that kind of a representative, generally they kind of fade into the background. They don't get anything accomplished. Kind of like Richard Hanna got nothing accomplished, did not represent the people of the district. And it wasn't until people actually paid attention and caught wind of how absolutely alien to the rank and file, regular average Joe viewpoint that he had, that's when he got forced out. And that's why he didn't run. Uh, that's why Rep Representative Richard Hanna lost. Um, and we see pretty much the same thing set up for Mr. Brindisi. Now, much like Mr. Brindisi, 
back in March of 2015, he started to, because he had no attention, no exposure, he started trying to gain some, uh, a couple of bills to get attention and to run. We're seeing that with Stephen Cornwell now. So in my opinion, he's looking to run for 2020. He's going to spend this time now getting his name out there, getting attention, making people aware, like if I'm wrong, that he actually did some major case um, that justifies this, that he's a strong law, and law enforcement guy, and he's going to try and run for Congress on that. And that's what I think. Um, I may be wrong. Probably not. We'll see how that goes. We've still got a long time to go, but uh, it'll be interesting, and we'll see if he gets out there. So with that said, yes, the 2020 election cycle has started already. It's January. It's already here. It's amazing. Um, I just don't even know what to make of it. It's like four days in. The guy just got, <laughs> Brindisi just got uh, uh, sworn in and already it looks like he's got a challenger, at least one. Uh, there's actually three people. Uh, and I should mention just for due diligence and uh, full accountability, uh, some people do consider me to be a candidate. I've, I did run in 2013. So some people do think that I could be a challenger. Uh, I haven't made up my mind on that. It's something I'm still thinking about and it's a little bit of a ways away. But we'll see. Uh, but with that said, we've had a great conversation here today. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't boring. I hope uh, we got to look at a couple of interesting aspects of all of this with you and talk about a couple of things that no one else is going to talk about. I know politics can be dry sometimes. It, and I know I didn't go for the easy talk conversation piece about the, uh, the shutdown of the government. But... That's being covered everywhere, and I don't have that much new to say about it. But we'll be talking about more of that, and we'll be talking about the red flag legislation. We'll be talking about the uh, social media password bill by State Senator Kevin Parker very soon. Uh, I will be having an interview with uh, County Executive Jason Garnar shortly in the next couple of uh, next week or so. I'll be having an interview with him. I look to speak with State Senator Fred Akshar very soon uh, about several of the bills that I've just mentioned and several other politicians as well. So I look forward to seeing everyone. I hope everyone is having a great start to 2019. And without further ado, uh, I'll see you next week and we'll have more interesting things to talk about as we go forward. I'll talk to you soon.